more than enough. My God is more than enough. Amen. I'm so thankful for my God. I'm so thankful for his love and his mercy. I'm so thankful for his greatness. And it's his greatness that gives me comfort. Enough comfort to fall down and to lay down everything at his feet. That greatness gives me that comfort to be able to do that. What he's already done is what gives me the strength to keep moving forward because I know what he can do. I know that he can do it. I know that he can show that love and that mercy to him or to me when I fall down. I'm so thankful. Thank you, Jesus, for your love and for your mercy. fall down, we lay our crowns at the feet of Jesus. The greatness of mercy and love at the feet of Jesus. We Our love. 
You give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness. You give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. Great are you. your praise. Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing.
the only one that deserves all the glory and all the honor and all the praise. Yes, He's such a good God. Great are you, Lord. Yes. Despite what this world looks like, despite what these circumstances look like, God, you are great. Yes. You are a great God, and yes. you are great, and you are good, and you are yes. God all by yourself, God. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for loving us. Thank you, Jesus. Give God some praise. He deserves it. And let's give Pastor Don a good hand as he comes. How many of you believe that it's all right to give honor where honor is due? Come on, let's tell the praise team one more time. Well, appreciation is burning in our heart for them. We love you so much. Thank you, Ben. You guys are awesome. We appreciate you so much. Look at your neighbor and tell them everything's going to be all right. Everything's going to be all right. Come on. Somebody said, maybe not today or tomorrow, but how many eventually everything turns and God brings a blessing. Maybe seated if you'd like. I know that all things mean all things, and we trust the Lord for all things this morning. I, I, I'm so amazed at what God is doing, and it was said a little bit earlier that if you're like I am, you deal with a lot of people that are going through hurting times. It seems like there's more people fighting battles than I've ever seen in my life, but how many of you know that means God's going to get greater glory than he's ever had before? So we're going to lift him up and honor him this morning. I'm going to have you go to the scripture with me for a moment. I want us to just look at some things very important. This season of the year, we always go back. Every year we go back and we, we just remember what was happening on the last week of the Lord's life. Palm Sunday is a time where we recognize that Jesus determined that it's time for my death and burial and resurrection but in anticipation of that, I have to set it in motion. I have to start it, and the catalyst really for the entire Holy Week begins with Palm Sunday. It happens when he decides to send his disciples to the city over against them. He said, you'll find a colt tied where no one has ever set. Loose it and bring it here. And if they ask you, why do you do it? Tell them the Lord has need of it, and they will allow it to happen. How many glad that God knows everything? Can I just sort of scramble your brain a little bit this morning? Did you realize that Jesus planned every detail of his suffering? If I planned my suffering, I'd make it easier. I'd be light on myself. He sent the disciples over. They got the, the animal. He was set upon it. He came into the city. We discussed last week because we're about a week ahead in this series because I don't want us to wait till Palm Sunday and then try to figure out what it is. Last Sunday we declared the fullness and the essence of what it was. This week we're going to be talking about the suffering, the passion of Christ, and then his death and burial, and then on Easter, of course, resurrection. But I want you to understand what is taking place as we go along so we can appreciate it as it comes. And I looked at this area of Scripture and I started realizing, and uh, Matthew says it one way that I, I really am amazed about. Chapter 21 just a verse, I'm not going to delay this long, but I want to show you what is really upon my heart. Um, as he's coming into the city, the Bible said there was a throng of people in front of him and behind him, tearing down palm branches off the tree and taking their garments off and throwing them in the path, which was the honorary thing that they would do for every dignitary or a king that would come into the province. And as they did that, they would uh, do it to show them, we want to lighten your load or we want to let you know we welcome you. And as they came, can you imagine taking off your outer garment and laying it down so that the, the king that's coming on a mule or whatever will be able not to have dusty pathway, but we recognize you. And as he came into the city, they're all shouting and they're saying, help us, save us. And then we come to the scary verse that has been on my heart all week long. The question is, uh, verse number 10, and when he was come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, all the city was moved, and all the city was saying, who is this? Isn't it amazing that we learned last week you really can't worship somebody you don't know you can't appreciate somebody effectively if you don't know them can you imagine a few thousand people maybe gathered in front and around him behind him and they're shouting all the shouts they're saying the right thing but they don't know who he is and this week the Lord woke me and he began to sh share with me and it just broke my heart I I realized that the Lord only came for one reason and that was to reveal himself who he is to us and then he wants to come and live inside of us. I don't know how rich you are. You may have a, a Rolls Royce or a stretch limousine or a mansion. You may have all this stuff. But if you don't have the Lord, you really don't have anything. Because what you have, you'll leave behind. But if you have the Lord, how many of you keep him forever and forever and forever? And he's not just Savior. How many of you know him as your Savior? He's washed away your sin. How many of you have had to call on him to be your healer? Anybody been healed a bunch of times? 
How many know he's a way maker where there is no way? He's a problem solver where there is no way for the problem to change. So we know him more and more as we get to know, as we get to know him better. How many of you are glad you know him better now than you did years ago? And it's not just knowing historically who he was or uh, his, his lineage. We uh, go to Matthew and we find out in the first chapter the lineage of where he came from and all the way back to the very beginning of the covenant. But I want to know him right now. I want to know him as the one that sticks closer than a brother. I want to know him as the one that never leaves me, never forsakes me. He's the one that loves me always. You know, people love you more when you love them back and do stuff for them. But the Lord doesn't love you any more or any less Am I right? He always loves you with all he has. Well, some people are more blessed. Well, the more you allow him to bless you. But he wants to bless you. Well, somebody tell your neighbor, this guy's good. And not that guy up there, but the Lord. How many understand the Lord? People come and they say, well, that's a good word. I said, I stole it from the Lord. How many we have nothing to say? We're a pile of dirt, but he can speak through us and bring salvation to humanity and bring victory to the people. Uh, if you'll just mark that, that, that for, for study this week, somebody's going to ask you questions. If you'll also write this down, Jeremiah 29 and 11. So many people probably have quoted this in the last 10 years, more than all of my 51 years of ministry. I've heard it quoted time and again, and it's so appropriate. Jeremiah said something. He said, I, I know the thoughts, one translation, I know the plans that I have for you. And it goes on to say, and it is for your good and for an expected end. Look at me. Jesus is the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. Can I just say it in a, in a crucial, in a, in a kind of a slang way? Jesus told Jeremiah to say that. You know what he's saying? I have plans for you. As he faces his worst week, he planned it. The Roman government didn't plan it. The church world that was against him didn't plan it. Jesus planned it. Can I tell you the hardest part of this? And I, I want you to get this in your spirit today. They didn't know what he was doing. Every step he took, they had no clue what he was doing. Uh, they, they shouted, Hosanna. They shouted, help us, save us. But they weren't talking to him as a savior. They were talking to him as a king that would come and get rid of the Roman government. Nobody likes to pay a lot of taxes April 14th. I don't mean to bug you on that in advance, but... And so they're thinking, he's just going to be a physical king. He's going to sit on the throne. He's going to make things a lot better for us than the Romans have. He did not come to be a king in the flesh. He did not want the throne of Rome. He wouldn't have taken it. If he had taken it, that's all you would have got. How many glad he didn't want that throne? He wanted to come and sit on the throne of your heart. He wanted to rule and reign not over a government of people. He wanted to rule and reign over people that willingly allow him to rule and reign in their life. Am I right? I'm glad that he wasn't willing to become uh, the one that kicked out the Roman government. I'm glad he was one that was willing to go in the temple and kick out the religious mess. So they could make it right again. Lord, I love this. How many of you realize he is king right now? He always will be and always can if you allow him to do that. When we recognize this area of scripture, I started looking at it. And Jeremiah said, I do know the thoughts that I, that I think toward you. They're thoughts of peace and not of evil. My thoughts are to give you an expected end. Let, let me say something again. This is a powerful area, and yet I want you to sort of let your spirit be willing to uh, expand a little bit. <laughs> All things do work together for the good. If you love him and you're called according to his purpose, that means if you want his will, you always have his will. He will not force his will on anybody. But if you're in his covenant, all things work together for the good. Everybody say all things. I love this because even though they didn't know who he was, he had planned this week for them. Uh, a scripture that has sort of messed with my mind since I was a little boy. My father was a minister and we were in church all the time. And every once in a while he would quote this. And he was talking about the passion of the Lord. We know the Last Supper. We know he's describing the bread as his body and the wine as his spirit and a new covenant. He's trying to get them to explain it or understand. They didn't really understand all that he was. And all the examples he gave, they still didn't quite grasp it. He went to the garden and prayed and agonized. And great drops of blood popped out in his brow. Because he was passionate about going forth and doing what was necessary to suffer like no man has ever suffered. Not for his sin because he didn't have any not for his sickness because he didn't have any he did that for me he did that for you because he loves you and if we don't understand it we will not benefit by it 
for the joy that was set before him. Is there joy right now when they're ripping your back off with a scourge? A scourge is a whip that has 13 straps attached to it. At the end of the strap, there's metal or bone pieces and fragments attached to it. So with every stripe, you're ripping open a man 13 times. Like a combine going through a field and ripping open the soil for the seed. You do it 39 times and Josephus, the historian, said you could literally look and see inside the hollow of his body. For the joy, not right now, but for the joy that was set before him. For the joy that would come if he's willing to suffer for us. How many millions of people do you think the Lord has healed since that day? How many millions of people have been saved from their sin eternal because of what he did that day? And the only benefit is for those that accept it because they believe it. You can't believe it if you don't understand it. How many don't understand all of it, but you understand enough to know that he loves you enough to forgive you if you let him? We're not talking about becoming deep. We're calling, calling his willingness to allow him. For the joy that was set before him, he went through the agony of the prayer in the garden. He went through the scourge of the whip. He went to the cross. For what? For the joy that would come when all this is done. How many of the Bible said weeping endures for a night? But what? For the joy that is set before you, joy will come in the morning. Somebody said, I'm going through a tough time right now. You need to go ahead and smile because this valley is going to be over and the mountaintop is in front of you and another victory is coming. Can I explain this because it's very simple and we won't prolong it, but when the Lord was taking his fine steps to, to, to Calvary, he was taking his final steps to his own death, he planned every step of the way. He planned it for me. Uh, nobody can love you like that. Nobody can care enough about you to suffer like he suffered. When we look at the, the Last Supper and he's in the garden and he's telling the disciples, and can you imagine how feverishly it seems he's doing it, saying, but, but this bread, just, just look at the bread. It's like, it's like my body. I, I'm going to get ready to come and live inside of you. And, and this, this wine, it's, it's like my life and my new covenant. I want you to drink in everything that I'm giving to you. And, and they looked at him like it's probably just a meal. Later they would understand, but at the moment they couldn't figure that out. I look at the scripture and it bothers me because he only came to get them to know him. He just wanted them to live forever. I hope I can express this the way it needs to be said, but can you imagine God living around sinners every day for three and a half years of ministry? He's surrounded by broken, hurting, wounded, messed up people. And he's healing the sick to get them to know that I can heal physically, but I can also heal you spiritually. He wanted every one of them to find salvation. A few did. They bumped into him and they said, oh, that's Joe and Mary's baby. But some of them knew who he was. Got down on their knees and they touched the hem of his garment and they were totally healed. Why were they healed? They knew who he was. The more you know about him, the more you can benefit. Palm Sunday when they're shouting, Hosannas, help us, save us. But they didn't know who he was breaks my heart to realize he said I'm coming into the city not to conquer Rome I'm here to conquer sin I'm here to give you the gift of eternal life and they didn't know what he was doing it hit me really early in the morning and I started looking at this and I thought that's the only reason he came was to live in us there's only one gift that matters you pass by the casket you go to the cemetery Nothing matters what they left at home, the car they drove. Nothing matters. What matters is, do they know the Lord? They're absent from their body, but they're present with the Lord. Why are they present with the Lord? Because they know him. The most important thing I can tell you, and and it grieves me to think that after all these years, and in this area over 30 years ministering and preaching in this area, it would really break my heart if I was to stand before God and look at people and they said, I I never did understand him. I never did know him. You didn't tell me. I'm going to tell you. You may not like me for telling it. I'll try it in a thousand different ways, but I want you to know him. You don't need to know about me. I'm just the messenger boy. I'm no more valuable than those speakers that carry the word. How many of you realize that if I can get you to know him, he can be everything you need for every situation, for everything you go through, for every trial, every heartache, because you will go through some of the things the Lord went through. It's not written down exactly, but history declares that probably Jesus lost Joseph 
the physical father when he was a young man because he was going to experience what it's like to have death in the family. He experienced everything in the human uh, agenda. He experienced it willingly. He wanted to experience it as God in the flesh. He went through so many things. But I look at this area of scripture and I started realizing he, he was betrayed. He, he was wounded. He just, if you'd like this, let me just tell you because you'll be asked maybe about some of this. Matthew 23, the Bible says they, the multitude arose and they led him to Pilate. The crowd, the same crowd that said, we want you to be our king. Hosanna is the same one that grabbed a hold of him and led him toward Pilate. They started accusing him. It goes on to say they were more fierce and they stirred up the people. Uh, he stirred up the people. They're angry at him for teaching about eternal life. Herod said, I, I don't find any fault with him, but the chief priest vehemently accused him. The church leaders vehemently accused him. Verse 18, and they cried out all at once, saying, Away with this man, release unto us Barabbas. Can you imagine you're here to save people and they're saying, Kill him? We would rather have the national murder released from prison than to have Jesus. It haunts me when I, on Facebook, you may have seen it, or if not, it, it just made my blood almost run cold. I, I saw a, a, a march against whatever it was, and one man right in the front was holding a picket sign, and it said, if Jesus does come back, we'll kill him again. How know the same spirit that killed him then is the same spirit that can get in us, but look, it will never be in you if you know him. You can know about him and hate him, but you can't know him without loving him. Probably on more tombstones than anything that I've ever seen in my life. To know him is to love him. How many of you glad you do know him and you do love him? He may not do things always the way you want it. You may get some times where you get confused about him. We've all had questions, but aren't you glad he's real and that he loves you with a perfect love? He came and planned his own demise. He planned every step along the way. When they, they scourged him, it says they put him before Pilate. They, they wrapped him up with a, a royal garment to mock him and say, look at him, what kind of a king is he? Here's a man that is stripped of his body. He's stripped of his blood. He's pouring out his life. Look at him. He calls himself victorious, and he can't even save himself. And they wrapped a garment around him. Can you imagine how it felt to be mocked and sped upon and slapped and beaten with the fist? This is Jesus that is only there to save them can only do that if you don't know who he is I remember as a child my dad and mom would always talk about him but there came a time I I met him for myself nobody's ever had to try to talk me into serving him nobody ever has to beg me to go to church I know I'm the preacher but I still <laughs> I mean, when you're in love with someone you like to be around them I got 50% amens on that. Those of you who just came out of divorce, I'm sorry for you. We'll pray for you. <laughs> Kathy and I are getting ready to celebrate just a week or something. 46 years of marital bliss. Amen. <laughs> oh, that was, that was weak. <laughs> that was really Sorry, Kathy, that was real weak. They'll make it up by buying you some gifts or something. You know why we hang out so much together? Because we want to. I had a dear friend in California, was married years and years and years, and he would go deer hunting, but he never would kill a deer. I said, so why aren't you ever successful at the beginning of the season? He said, I can't. He said, if I kill a deer, then I can't continue going hunting, and I can't be around my wife that much. I just got to, <laughs> just, just a thought. <laughs> and he was serious. And I knew her, I understood why, I'm just trying to help you. <laughs> but how many of he was so in love with her, he probably wouldn't even gone hunting? You should have really missed a time right there to say amen. How many when you're really in love with, remember when you first fell in love and you're on the phone all the time back in the days when they had the, amen. Come on, you used up all your minutes. Don't tell me you didn't do that. Kathy and I didn't do that because back in our days, we didn't have cell phones, so we had to put quarters. I was in Ohio, and she was in Detroit, so I had to put all of my salary in quarters at the local laundromat. I know you don't know what that is, you young people, but it's where you used to wash your clothes. And that's where my money went because I loved her, and I wanted to talk to her. If I couldn't be with her, I wouldn't talk to her. I said, well, that's weird. No, it's not. That's called loving. <laughs> that's why we got some people who don't need to hang around him, I guess. How many glad you love him? When I look at this, and, and just, just let me say it, 
Can you imagine the ones that yes, just a week ago were saying, he's going to save us, he's going to fix everything, and next week they're saying, kill him, we don't want him. We would rather have a murder lead us or be a part of our life than this guy, kill him. Again, you can't do that if you know him. When we look at this scripture, it says that they took him to the place, uh, the, the far wall of the Antonio prison. They took him there. Can you imagine the pain of being all alone? Where's his disciples? They knew he was a healer because they watched him. They knew he could raise the dead because they were there when he raised Lazarus. And the little boy on his way to being buried, Jesus raised the boy and gave him back to his mom and he got up and lived again. They knew he could do that. But when they didn't understand why, he's not fighting for himself. He's in the garden and they came out against him with a, an army and he doesn't fight. He just says, you know, put away your sword. This is why I came. I came to die. And they didn't get that and they were fearful because they thought they could die because they didn't understand. He was abandoned. Have you ever been abandoned? Have you ever had people that love you walk away? It hurts. And the ones that should have been there were gone. Uh, Peter, you know, he came and stood way far away watching what was going to happen. Lord, and then he... He cursed and swore he didn't even know him three times. So, It's really hard when the ones that you're getting ready to turn the ministry over to don't even know who you are yet. And you're at the end of your ministry and you've done every miracle the possible to show them who you are so that they can carry on your ministry. But somehow they didn't get it. I, I just want to say it. I'm glad I know him better right now than I did last year. Amen. It's not because I'm good. It's not because I'm better. I want to know him. I don't know, want to know him just out of holy writ and scripture. I read it to know about him, but I also want to have my own personal encounter. I want to know him. And I do. And I, that's what I'm going to encourage you to do as we face this season this year. I don't want it just to be another, you know, let's go to the cross and let's go to the... No, no, no. How many of you realize when he's coming in on the mule into the city and they're waving palm branches and they're shouting and making all that noise... Did you realize they didn't know who he was? Can I just tell you, he doesn't want you to wave palm branches in his face if you don't know him. He doesn't want you to make him a pathway home if you don't even know him. He only came so you could know him. And once you know him, you can have him forever. Is anybody hearing me this morning? When I get in this area of scripture, I realize again that he chose his punishment. He knew that the Roman government at that time would inflict upon you a 39-stripe scourge. One more stripe, historians say it would cause the, the, enough muscle would be torn out of your back and your shoulders. You would you'd atrophy and you'd be crippled. You'd be quadriplegic. If they beat you one more time with 13 more agonizing stripes and gashes in your body, you would literally bleed out or you would either die or you'd be a cripple for the rest of your life. So the law said, let's back off just enough to allow them to remain punished greatly but not kill them. How many of you realize he came that close to death with that many stripes so that every one of your sicknesses could be healed? 39 times 13. I haven't been in a school for a while, but that's a lot of sicknesses and diseases. Somebody said there's about 39 major medical diseases. What's more important to me is the number 39 is significant because it's 13 three times. It's the curse, mind, soul, and body that he broke. How many of you realize he took our sickness? He took our sin. He took our sorrow. But again, listen closely. If you don't know that, you won't benefit. You know why Christians can walk through things and still smile and still praise and believe? Because they know him. We can go through things. We suffer just like everybody else. The Bible said we go through the same thing the world goes through. But we have the Lord. I've watched people by a casket and I've watched them weeping. But they don't weep the way people weep that have no hope. You know what they say? They're not here. They're present with the Lord. They're shouting on the other side. People that don't know about the Lord, they feel like it's all over now. Aren't you glad you know him? Aren't you glad that when you walk in the hospital room, you can pray and know that God knows how to take over? Somebody say, what if it doesn't happen my way? I know God is still God. He knows how to heal. He knows how to deliver. If you know him, boy, I love this. When I look at this area, again, I'm going to say this. He chose for them to put a crown of thorns upon his head. I have a crown of thorns in the back, and it's very small. It's not big as the one that the Lord had, but... They said in those days the crown of thorns was so thick that uh, each, each one of the spikes was about as big as your little finger. 
And they, they literally would use it to start fires in the palace. They would leave these thorns around as kindling for a fire to start a fire in the palace to, when it was cold. And, and, but they, they twisted one of those and they made it round enough that they put it on his head. And then they took reeds and they started beating it into his brow. He did that. And I believe the reason he did that was because he wants you to know, I know how to heal you. And every one of my stripes are not just on my back. It's not just the nails in my hand or the spear in my side. But how many of you know there's scars in your head? There's pain in your mind. There's emotional stress. There's discouragement. There's suicidal tendencies. There's thoughts of depression and anxiety. I believe he took those stripes in his own mind so that you and I can be free from every kind of a circumstance that comes to us because of the human experience. He chose his own beating. The writer said, and if you want to read Psalm uh, David's account of this, you'll recognize that David is saying, you could look inside the hollow of his body. You could literally look. He said, I looked down from the cross. This is prophetic from David talking about the suffering of the Lord. He said he could look down and he could literally see his bones staring back at him. His tongue cleaves to the roof of his mouth, sucking for air to exist as he's standing on a nail, trying to elevate his arms. You know the story, they would hang them by their nails in their hands and the only way they could get oxygen was to stand up and elevate because the arms at that position, when you're hanging and holding your body, your lungs collapse and your lungs won't allow you to have oxygen unless you can get an elevation. So with every breath and every word that he gave, he had to stand on the nail again and pull himself up on the nail to get enough air to breathe. I love that song, even the breath and even the air that's in our lungs is given to us. He suffered all of that because he loved me. And I know it. Paul said, I, I want to know him in the power of his resurrection. Somebody said, well, what does that mean? Let me give you another slant on that. I believe he said, I want to know him and the benefit of his suffering. I want to know him in the power of his death. I want to know him in the power of his resurrection. Because in his resurrection, he conquered death. He conquered hell. He conquered the grave. That's the God I want to know. That's the Savior I want you to experience. Very simple this morning and yet very profound. It says that... While he's hanging on the cross and he's agonizing and he's breathing his last. And can you imagine the disciples are gone, the thousands of people that he had healed? They're not there. The ones he had healed are now turning against him, mocking, spitting, cursing him. But there's Mary and the other Mary and an aunt and John, the beloved. And he's looking down at the disciples and it's kind of hard when you got that many friends for so long and then all of a sudden you don't have anybody. But he planned to be alone. I, I love this story, maybe one of my favorite areas of scripture. It says while he's hanging there, one of the malefactors, probably a murderous thief, was dying for his wrongs. said, hey, if you're a son of God and you're a savior, why don't you just get down and get us down? In other words, do things physical, do it our way. And the other thief looked over at him and said, you don't understand, this man has done nothing wrong. Then he looked at Jesus in his agony while he's dying, and he said, remember me. When you come into your kingdom, he could not have understood a lot about it. But somehow he knew him just enough to want him. You know what the Lord did? He created last-minute salvation. If I was a holy roller, I'd run around the building and say, whoo, hallelujah. But at my age, I just think about it. How many of you realize he paid for last minute salvation? I lost count of how many people I've walked into their hospital rooms as they're dying. Whispered in their ear, your family loves you, I love you. We're not going to let you go without accepting the Lord. We want you to accept Jesus. I've never had a person say, no, get out of here, I don't want you. But they would hold my hand and pray with me. One man held my hand that family said had been given up. He wouldn't let go. Couldn't talk, couldn't do anything, but he held on. I said, if you really know what I'm saying and you've prayed this prayer, hold on. You know what that's called to me? Last minute salvation. Do you know when Jesus decided to do that and invent that? As he's dying. And he told the thief that was no longer a thief. Matter of fact, he's totally free now from all of his guilt. Hey, today you and I are going to be in paradise. But somebody say today, look at me, because he finally knew him. 
This season, I want you to know him in ways you've never known him before. I want you to know him as peace if you're going through a trauma. I want you to know him as joy if you're going through sorrow. I want you to know him as forgiveness if you've messed up. I said, I fell down. Even a righteous man falls down seven times and God restores. Get up. God wants to restore you. Can everybody stand to your feet for a moment? He died to kill my sin. He was buried to conquer the fact that I don't ever have to be buried and remain. They may bury my body, but they won't bury Don Young. Billy Graham said before he passed, he said, one day you'll hear the news that Billy Graham has passed. He said, don't you dare believe it. I'm not dead. I, I did move. I've gone to a better place, but I'm still alive more than ever before in my life. I'm going to ask you to bow your head if you would today. Father God, I ask you to honor this preacher on this, this very special Sunday. Someone that has heard about you and they've watched the joy and the smiles and the celebration and the laughter. Maybe they heard the song of praise worship that made them realize that these people know what they're singing about. They believe in this Jesus. If he's only a historical figure and you've never really allowed him to be your personal Lord. If, if you don't know him, please today. He came so that he could crawl inside of your life. He came to be a part of you. He came to give you life abundantly. Yes, he's a healer of the physical body, but this body is not intended to last forever. He, he came to give you life for your spiritual man. He came to give you the gift of eternal life. Be so wrong of me today if I don't give you an open door opportunity to accept him as your Savior. Is there anyone in this room that has not really got to know him? It's not an indictment against you. It's not a criticism. We simply say, we want you with us for eternity. We want to know that it's well with your soul. Time comes that your life is over. I want to be able to say about you, I know that they knew the Lord. And I know where they are. They're absent from this body. But they are shouting on the hills of glory. And the land where wicked will cease from troubling. And the weary will be at rest. They're at peace forever and forever and forever. And if you don't know him, I don't mean know about him. If you don't know him, please. All of us are saying, please, get to know him. Receive him and accept him, and he will wash away every sin and every stain. Everything that you've ever done, even the thoughts and the imaginations, the iniquities of the mind, he'll wash that away. If you need him for that, I want you to come for just a moment. I want to agree with you and celebrate the gift that Jesus paid for. So his dying is not in vain. His suffering is not in vain. We recognize it. We recognize him often said this, but I'll probably be about the last one that leaves the door. And if I say, well, I'm, I'm embarrassed to come in front of everybody. I understand sometimes that may be a part of it. But eventually you're going to let everybody know that you love him. Because you will want everybody to know what you know and have what you have in him. I'm going to ask while our heads are bowed for just a moment. I realize in this morning there are situations in this room that need to be healed. There's threats and there's circumstances and there's situations that only God can change. A little bit different this morning while our heads are bowed. If you're needing a healing touch, hope, uplifting, if you need a change in your life, we're not playing games. This is eternally serious. I'm going to ask you to do it a little different. I want you to come and tell me so we can agree. God said when there's agreement and unity, there's a commanded blessing. I believe that God is still healer. I believe he's savior and victory giver. I want you to come while they're ministering in song and in music. I want to stand right here and I want to come into agreement with you and allow the fix the things that need to be fixed and change those things that need to be changed. We're going to touch and anoint today for the purpose of eternal victory. Amen. Amen. I'm going to ask if my Timothys would come and help me this morning.